the way, the truth, and the life. Wayne Cochran Ministries. A voice for Jesus, bringing heaven to earth with God's love, God's grace, and God's word. And now, from Miami, Florida, Wayne Cochran. All right. I'm so glad you joined us again this week. Remember who we left off last week. We're talking about how to talk to God and how to hear from God and how to be led, led by God himself from the throne of God. Divine guidance. And if you're led by divine guidance, you will win. And this will be your year of thanksgiving and abundance. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'm not going to read the first three verses. I'm going to start where we left off in verse 4. If you didn't hear last week, then call and get the CD because you want to hear this anyhow. Now, in King James, it's for chapter, verse 4 says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. In other words, builds up himself, benefits himself. But in the Amplified, it says, Who he speaks in an un strange, unknown tongue edifies and improves himself. But he who prophesies, interpreting the divine will and purpose and teaching with inspiration, edifies and improves the church and promotes growth in Christian wisdom, piety, holiness, and happiness. So now already hear that if you want to talk to God, speak in tongues to God. You can pray to God in your language with understanding, the Bible calls it, or you can pray to him in the spirit. And I'm going to show you in a minute the difference in the two. Verse 5, now I wish that you might all speak in unknown tongues, and more especially, I want you to prophesy to be inspired. This is to Pastor Paul talking to you. I want you to be inspired to preach and interpret the divine and will and purpose. He who prophesies, who is inspired to preach and teach, is greater and more useful and more important than who, he who speaks in unknown tongues, unless he should interpret what he says so that the church may be edified and receive good from it. He says if you're in church and you speak in an unknown tongue, then you need to be able to interpret that into your language so the church can benefit. Otherwise, you're not going to help them at all. Speaking in an unknown tongue edifies you. Verse 6, Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in unknown tongues, how shall I make it to your advantage unless I speak to you either in revelation, disclosure of God's will to man, in knowledge or prophecy or in prophecy or in instruction? Even if in an inanimate musical instrument such as the flute or harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone listening know or understand what's played? If the war bugle gives an uncertain, indistinct call, who will be prepared for battle? Just so it is with you. If you in unknown tongues speak words that are not intelligible, how will anyone understand what you're saying? For you'll be talking into empty space. There are, I suppose, all these many to us unknown tongues in the world somewhere, and none is destitute of its own power of expression and meaning. But if I do not know the force and significance of the speech or language, I shall seem to be a foreigner to the one speaking to me, and the speaker who addresses me will seem as a foreigner to me. So it is with yourself, since you're so eager and ambitious to possess spiritual endowments and manifestations of the Holy Spirit, concentrate on striving to excel and to abound in them in ways that will build up the church. You who want to be spiritual, you who want to be involved in, in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, listen to what he's saying. He said, concentrate on and strive to excel and to abound in ways that will build up the church. Therefore... The person who speaks in an unknown tongue should pray for the power to interpret and explain what he says. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, by the Holy Spirit with me, prays, but my mind is unproductive, it bears no fruit and helps nobody. Then what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, by the Holy Spirit that's within me, but I'll also pray intelligently with my mind and understanding. 
I will sing with my spirit by the Holy Spirit that's within me, but I will sing intelligently with my mind and understanding also. Otherwise, if you bless and render thanks with your spirit, thoroughly aroused by the Holy Spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider or who is not gifted with interpretation of unknown tongues say amen to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you're saying? To be sure, you may give thanks well and nobly, but the bystander is not edified. It does him no good. I thank God. I speak with tongues, strange languages more than any of you or all of you put together. Nevertheless, in public worship, I would rather say five words with my understanding and intelligently in my uh, order in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a strange tongue, our language. Then he says, brethren, don't be ch immature children in your thinking. Continue to be babes in matters of evil, but your minds mature. Be mature men. He says, listen, be immature and unknowing for when it comes to evil, but when it comes to God's will, how about maturing and acting like mature people? Now, he didn't say not pray in tongues, as some say. He said there's just a place for it and a purpose for it. In fact, there's an incredible purpose for it. I want to tell you something my wife and I learned a long time ago. We learned by a great minister who's recently passed on. He's with the Lord. But here's what I learned, and it has so benefited me and my wife in our life. I want to pass it on to you. In verse 14, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me prays, but my mind is unproductive. It bears no fruit and helps nobody. Then what am I to do? Here's what you're to do. I will pray with my spirit by the Holy Spirit that within me, but I'll also pray intelligently with my mind and understanding. I will sing with my spirit by the Holy Spirit that's within me, but I will sing intelligently with my mind and understanding also. Here's how we apply that, and we were taught to apply that. And I know it works because we've done it many times. He says, when you go to pray, pray to God and speak in an unknown tongue to God. Well, I tell you what, look at Romans, before we go there, look at Romans chapter 8. We're going to come back to that now. You're going to hear something right now. Verse 26, Amplified. So too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness for we don't know what prayer to offer nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And he who searches the hearts of men know, uh, knows what is, is in the mind and the, of the Holy Spirit what his intent is because the spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. Now listen. He says, when you don't know how to pray as you ought, pray in tongues, pray in groanings and utterings that you don't know. Just pray to God because the Holy Spirit knows God's heart and will and intent for you and he knows what your will and intent in your heart is. And he will offer up on your behalf to God a prayer in line with the will of God, the perfect will of God. So when you don't know how to pray as you ought, let the Holy Spirit pray and you'll be praying according to God's will in any situation. But now what he's saying over here in 1 Corinthians 14 is when you do that, Pray in an unknown tongue. Pray, let God speak, the Holy Spirit speak to you. Pray, quote it by And then listen quietly. Listen to me. When you get through praying in tongues to the Lord and you feel that you've prayed through, you feel released, then I want you to close your eyes. I want you to sit and listen. But listen. It may be a voice that is different from yours. It may sound like it's your own voice. It may sound like just thoughts. But listen. And the next few things that you hear, write them down. 
And you're going to be praying now with understanding. You're going to see with understanding what the Spirit prayed to the Lord and what the Lord prayed back. In other words, pray in the Spirit and then listen, see what God says. Pray in the Spirit and then listen to see what God says. My wife and I have done that so many times. We've never done that, that when we hear from God and we obey what we hear, that we haven't come to victory. But remember now, pray in the Spirit, then listen to see what you hear back. It may be in a quiet voice within, Praise God. Now, it probably won't be in Elizabethan. Thou art, how art, here art, we art. No, no, no. God's probably going to speak to you in, in a way that's understandable to you. It's going to sound just like your friend talking to you. It's your, it's, it's your thoughts being guided by God. It's God's thoughts being, being, being knowledgeable in your mind. So listen, pray in the Spirit and then listen. Pray in the Spirit and then listen. And then write down what you hear. Now, if you want to, you can speak it out. Pray in the Spirit and then listen. And then speak out what you hear. And you're going to be hearing what God just prayed for you, what the Holy Spirit prayed for you. You need to learn to do this. This is how you talk to God, how you hear from God. How you talk to God, how you hear from God. Learn to do this and be led by the Holy Spirit according to the will of God. It's going to change your life. Now, I'm not saying that when you're walking down the street, in fact, this will begin to happen more and more. You'll be walking down the street if you continue to thank God and continue to thank God and, and develop a lifestyle of thanksgiving, you'd be walking down the street and all of a sudden you'll hear that voice again. God will just speak to you. God will just speak to you. And God will just speak to you. And now you're being led by divine knowledge and divine guidance. You're being led by the very throne of God, from the throne of God himself. And more and more, you're going to start walking and living in victory. I will tell you this, the more important the subject that you're praying for is, the more important to you, the harder it's going to be to hear from God because if you don't watch it, fear set in. And you can't hear God in fear. Don't let fear set in. And don't be distracted by God, from God. But don't give up. If you pray and don't hear nothing, don't worry about it. Come back and do it again. If you pray and hear something and you're not sure it's God, don't worry about it. You're not going to upset God. You're not going to uh, discourage God. And you're not going to, God's not going to be mad at you because you couldn't hear him plainly. Just do it again. He knows our weaknesses and our infirmities. He's easily touched by them. But pray and listen again. And pray and listen again. And you'll sooner or later know. Now, one of the ways I know when I hear from God, when I pray in tongues and then sit and listen, is if I all of a sudden get a thought that I've never thought before about something that I've never dreamed of, then I know it wasn't me. That had to be God. It wasn't me. And you say, well, how do I know I'm not hearing from the devil? How do I know I'm hearing from God? That's why you need to know the word. Because if you hear something that opposes the word, that wasn't God, that was the devil. He said, worship me in spirit and in truth, in word and in spirit. It's both. Now, what we're talking about is revealed knowledge. This is God revealing to you in the spirit, spirit to spirit, what his will and purpose is for you. And he'll be able to lead you and guide you to those things that's been set up for you that I have not seen, not ear heard, that's never entered into your mind what God has laid up for you. Woo! That's going to be revealed in these last days. And then you'll understand what Ephesians 2.10 says when he says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works that he had before ordained that we should walk in them living the good life. 
God's going to finally be able to lead us in the life that he has for us and chose for us. And finally be walking in the wisdom and the knowledge and the power of God by the Spirit of God. Now, I want you to go back and look at uh, Romans 8. And we're going to include a scripture, as I said before, that should be included in this every time we read it. Because this is part of it. We read this scripture uh, outside, uh, separate from the, the scripture right before it. But they go together. Now listen. When uh, we read this, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now remember the things he's hidden that's never been dreamed of. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he may be the firstborn among many brethren. For then whom he did predestinate, he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. Whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, let's go back. Here's what I want to tell you. That scripture, and we know that all things work together for good for them that love God that's called according to his purpose. We quote that all alone, out of context of what it's really saying. But let's put it in context. Here's what it's really saying. I'm going to read, start uh, in verse 26 in the Amplified. So too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness, for we do not know what prayer to offer and how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads on our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit, what his intent is. Because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to in harmony with God's will. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, these verse 27 talking about, all things work together and are fitting into a plan to, for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. So when you put verse 26, 27 with 28, now it's in context. For all of us then who are praying in the spirit and listening for God's divine will and guidance, become sensitive to his voice. Because remember in John, book of John, it says, for his sheep know his voice. You'll get to know it. And when you're doing that, now all things work together for good. Why? Because you're going to be doing what he's called you to do, what he's instructed you to do, what he's led you to do, and it's going to work out because he's going to empower you to do it. And it's his power working in you and through you that's going to get it done. And then you can say what Jesus said. Hey, listen, I don't do anything of my own will or my own understanding, no. I do what God says to do. And it's his power working in me that gets it done. And you'll be able to say exactly what he said. Now, I hope that I haven't made this too complicated and get distracted and take distractions over here and over here. What I'm saying is this. We've already read and, and heard in this teaching in Scripture that God wants to instruct us. Jesus says that in John 16, that the Holy Spirit comes to instruct us and teach us. Now we read that there's things that God has hidden from us, hidden from the world since the foundation of the world, that we can't even imagine that he's hidden for us and laid up for us, that he's going to reveal to us, he said in, in his last days, by his Spirit. When we begin to walk in that revelation and that knowledge, and that power, finally, people are going to take notice because we don't come in just word alone. We come in power, empowered by God, and things are going to change. So I want you to begin to pray in the Spirit and then listen to God and begin to do what he tells you to do. You got that now? I want you to look back at Ephesians 3. And I hope we got time to go to this next part. And if not, we will go ahead and start it. In Ephesians chapter 3. Remember it says in Romans 8 verse 14 through 18. 
that we're going to know and be taught by God spirit to spirit. Now, with this not, if you look at verse 1 of Ephesians 3, and, uh, and you he made alive when you were dead or slain by your trespass. I'm sorry, verse 2, verse 3. For this reason, because I preach that you are thus built up together, I, Paul, am the prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake and on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, his unmerited favor that was entrusted to me to dispense to you for your benefit, and that the mystery or secret, now remember, we already know what that is. That's what it says, what eye has not seen, the ear heard, and it's not entered into the heart of man. What's going to be revealed in the last days for your benefit has been stored up for you. And what the mystery was made known to me and that I was allowed to comprehend it by direct revelation as I already briefly wrote you. Now, the word that's in the word is the word logos. It means logic. But when God reveals something to you by the Spirit, it's called rhema or revelation. Now, here's, here's what's exciting. Listen. When you pray in the Spirit and you hear God speaking back to you, that's revelation. That's God revealing. So now you don't just know the Word. God's revealing to you what He meant by the Word. That's why He says it. The world can't know this because they consider it foolishness. The world can't know the revelation of God. Can't hear the revelation of God. But you can and I can. When you read this so you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, this mystery was never disclosed to human beings in past generations that has now been revealed to his holy apostles, consecrated messengers, and the prophets by the Holy Spirit. You know, stop right there. I, I, I might not have time to do all this, but I want to go back to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to go back to this because we keep coming upon this word and I want to make sure that you get the connection. Okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, but on the contrary, as the scripture says, what eye has not seen nor ear heard and has not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared and made to keep ready for those who love him, who hold him in affectionate reverence, properly obeying him, gratefully recognizing the benefits he's bestowed. Yet to us, God has unveiled and revealed them by and through his spirit, for the Holy Spirit searches diligently, exploring and examining everything, even sounding the profound and bottomless things of God, the divine things that's hidden beyond man's scrutiny. And what person perceives, knows, and understands what passes through a man's thoughts except the man's own spirit within him. Just so no one discerns and comes to know and comprehend the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we've not received the Spirit that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit which is from God given to us that we might realize and comprehend and appreciate the gifts of divine favor and blessings so freely and lavishly bestowed upon us. That's what he's talking about all these times when he said this. This mystery, verse 5 of chapter 3 of Ephesians, this mystery which was never disclosed to human beings in past generations and has now been revealed to his holy apostles, consecrated messengers and prophets by the Holy Spirit. It is this, that the Gentiles are now to be fellow heirs with the Jews. The word fellow heirs there means partnership or partakers, that you have a part of the same body and, and joint partakers sharing in the same divine promise as Christ through your acceptance of the glad tidings of the gospel. In other words, this, this secret that's hidden, part of it is yours. You're in partnership. You have a part of that. You have a part to play and a part that belongs to you. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's free grace, undeserved favor, which was bestowed on me by the exercise and the working and all its effectiveness of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints of God, consecrated people, this grace, favor, privilege was granted and graciously entrusted. 
to proclaim to the Gentiles the unending, boundless, fathomless, incalculable, and exhaustless riches of Christ's wealth, which no human being could have searched out. Also to enlighten all men and make plain to them what is the plan regarding the Gentiles and providing for the salvation of all men of the mystery kept hidden through the ages and concealed until now in the mind of God who created all things. The purpose is that through the church, the complicated, many-sided wisdom of God in all its infinite variety and innumerable aspects might now be made known to the angelic rulers and authorities, principalities and powers in a heavenly sphere. In other words, God's will for you, God's will for the earth, this mystery God's had hidden, the devil don't know, the demons don't know, and they're going to learn it through us as it's revealed through us. Praise God. Don't worry about the devil and the demons don't have power over you. You have power over them. You need to get this and listen to it and begin to communicate with God. See you next week. God loves you. This program has been brought to you by friends and partners of Wayne Cochran Ministries.